Shiva is running for president. I found out about this literally the other day. Uh, Dr. Shiva, for those who are not aware, he taught at MIT. He was a professor at MIT. He also was a student at MIT before he was a professor there. He's also known for inventing email. Yes, email. Although there's some controversy uh, around that. We'll get into that in, in just a second. And I remember Dr. Shiva actually ran against Elizabeth Warren uh, when Elizabeth Warren was running for re-election for U.S. Senate. So he ran against her and there was a big to do during the debates because there were protesters there during Elizabeth Warren's debate with uh, Jeff Deal. Jeff Deal's like a Trumper dude. He's run for multiple positions. He keeps losing. I don't know. What, I don't know what his deal is. Anywho, they would not let Dr. Shiva debate. And this was a big deal. And, you know, like obviously supporters of Dr. Shiva were not happy about this. So they did protest during the debate. You could hear them if you were watching it on television saying, let Shiva debate, let Shiva debate. So it was a big deal. Uh, he is a very uh, controversial figure to some because some of his beliefs and views are not on par with what the establishment would like. But I don't have to continue to explain to you who he is. I want to show you his campaign video for president, and then I'm going to get into this interview that he had with Kim Iverson. There's a couple of issues that they discussed that I think we really need to focus on. And I will say this, Dr. Shiva uh, has kind of been known for revealing information before other people did and they got credit for it. And you're going to see that in this campaign video for president. So here we go. Who would have ever thought I'd be running for president of the United States of America? I was born a low caste untouchable in India's caste system, a system of aristocracy, oppression, and racism. My name is Dr. Shiva Ayadure. I'm an MIT PhD, a Fulbright scholar, a scientist, engineer, entrepreneur, and inventor. My family and I left India to come to America on my seventh birthday. I grew up in the working class neighborhoods of New Jersey, playing baseball, mowing lawns, painting houses and coding software. My friends and neighbors are Blacks, Italians, Irish, people of all races. As a 14 year old, I wrote 50,000 lines of software code to create the world's first email system and was awarded the first US copyright for email, recognizing me as its official inventor at a time when copyright was the only way to protect software inventions. I did that long before I ever came to MIT revealing that big innovations can occur anytime, any place by anybody. Growing up, I saw politicians dividing us by race and religion in both America and India to have us fighting each other while they remained safe in their gated communities and in their playgrounds of Hollywood, Martha's Vineyard and Silicon Valley. I'm a fighter. I fought racism and exposed their imperialist wars, fought for workers and put my life on the line against global corruption. I never wanted to run for political office. All that changed when I saw working Americans as never before being duped by the establishment and the not so obvious establishment across left and right. We were being sold out and made to forget. Did you guys notice that Vosh was there? <laughs> look, hold on, hold on. Look, look, watch. Um, I saw you, Wary. What'd you say, Wary? Wary said, come on, man, you didn't invent email. Actually, he explains that pretty well. Um, let me, let me finish, hold on. Never before being duped by the establishment and the not so obvious establishment across left. <laughs> this cracked me up because he showed TYT. Look guys, the not so obvious establishment. This is important. He showed AOC. Look, he shows all of them. AOC, Dave Rubin. Vosh, I'll go back and let it play. Sorry. I thought it was funny. Before being duped by the establishment and the not so obvious establishment across left and right, we were being sold out and made to forget why we came to America and why America existed. Lawyers, academics, billionaires, celebrities and politicians, elites, Clintons, Kennedys, Bidens, Obamas, Bushes, black and white have hijacked America. They printed trillions for their friends. They delivered crumbling infrastructure, corruption and racism. They transfer trillions to themselves, dividing black and white, fear-mongering and fake science, lockdowns and censorship, 
Dirty air, food and water, pushing drugs upon us, making us sicker. We've been sold out. One set of rules for them and another for us. We deserve a warrior with a history of courage in putting everything on the line for you, who believes in you, not them, who has created a movement bottoms up for truth, freedom, health. I've exposed their lies at the right time, never waiting until it was popular. I've exposed their false gods. We got to pause here for a second because he points out RFK and why is that important? It was brought to my attention, again, this is all coming my way like as of yesterday. It was brought to my attention yesterday that some of the talking points that RFK Jr. has, he actually got from Dr. Shiva. That includes not just the issues with the censorship, but also his issues in reference to the jab, that he got that from Dr. Shiva. Let me let it play. He called him a false, a false god. Ever waiting until it was popular, I've exposed their false gods who exist to lead you back to them. I've exposed their fake science of lockdowns and masking and provided you solutions to fight them and win and protect your immune system, saving millions. I exposed Fauci, galvanized the fire Fauci campaign when others remained silent. When they stole our election, we sued the government and Twitter in our historic 2020 federal lawsuit, exposing in bare view the government and big tech censorship infrastructure, the unholy alliance between government and social media companies. Where was Elon and his grifters? They stood by the sidelines and did nothing. They did not. We're going to get into this too. This is another point in the interview that we're going to talk about where Dr. Shivra basically explains that he called out the government tapping into social media and especially Twitter was one of the big ones where they were actually telling Twitter executives what to do and who to censor and who to suppress. And he knew because it happened to him. Remember, this is someone that writes code. Like they can figure these things out. So he claims that he called that out earlier on. And not only did he call it out, but he reached out to Elon Musk about it. He reached out to Donald Trump about some of these things like early on and nothing was done. And then Elon Musk decides to do the Twitter files. And now he's praised like this big hero. So we'll get into all of that in the uh, the interview, but this is a call out video if I've never seen one, I gotta tell you that one. And Twitter in our historic 2020 federal lawsuit, exposing in bare view, the government and big tech censorship infrastructure, the unholy alliance between government and social media companies. Where was Elon and his grifters? They stood by the sidelines and did nothing. They did not use their megaphones to help us when it could have made a big difference. Now our movement grows for truth, freedom, health independent of all of them. Every day, millions are learning the science of systems, the knowledge the elites do not want you to have. So you may learn how to think, stand up and fight, independent of the establishment of left and right and their fake heroes. Now it's time for you to join the movement to win back America, to win back truth, win back freedom, win back your health. That's why I'm running for president of the United States. This race is about you. This race is about truth, freedom, health versus power, profit, control. We've had enough. They think we'll fall in line and vote again for their lawyers, celebrities, billionaires, and chosen ones from above. We choose our heroes from below, from the rank and file who do what is right at the right time, not when it's convenient and popular. They can never represent us. What America needs is a movement by the working people for the working people who are educated, organized, decentralized, and fight for independence from their systems of control. And that movement exists. It's ready for you. We don't need them. We need us to go bottoms up, neighbor to neighbor. My journey, your journey are all the same. It's our time. It's time we had one of us. It's time to win back truth, freedom, health, to win back America, be part of this historic movement all the way to our victory on November 5th, 2024. If you're an American citizen, pledge your vote now for Dr. Shivaya Dure, the independent candidate for U.S. president. No matter where you live, you can be a part of this. Volunteer as little as 20 minutes a day. Don't delay. This is Dr. Shiva Adure, and I approve this message paid for by Dr. Shiva for president. So that is his campaign uh, video. He is running as an independent. Um, we're going to get into this interview that he had with Kim Iverson. Uh, Kiski says... Please bring Shiva on for an interview. You know, he's local to me, so I, I could try to see. 
I can invite him more for an interview, but actually, since he's local to me, I could try to see if he could do an in-person interview. Can't promise that though. Uh, people are very busy, but, um, here we go. Let's dive into this interview we had with Kim Iverson. The very first issue that I do want to focus on is where he was born, because this is one of the questions I had, like running for Congress is one thing, running for Senate is one thing. But when I found out that he was running for president, I wondered how can that be? Because Dr. Shiva was born in India. He wasn't born in the U.S. Just like I, I constantly continue to tell people when they say, why why won't uh, Shama run for president or something like that? And I say, I think Shama was born in India. Um, so uh, this is interesting. You tell me guys what you think about this. Um, let me know what you think about this. He says, I guess there's some loopholes here, but of course, Kim coming straight out the gate. Uh, first question that she asked him, I don't blame her. I would ask the same thing. I think we all want to know how's this going to happen. All right. And is, am I on full screen? Did I do full screen? Did I do? There we go. Uh oh. There's no. And oh, that's me. you know my my reluctance about all of this because of the the you're not you were not born in the United States. You're not a naturalized citizen. Um, and I'm so, a naturalized citizen. Oh, you are. I'm a naturalized. Sorry. Yes, yeah. you're not. You but you weren't born in the United States, and that means that according to the laws that we have in this country. There's certain parameters on who can and cannot run for president. And if you were not born in the United States, now that could be debated on whether or not that should be the case, but it is the case at this point and you cannot run for president or you cannot be president uh, if you were not born in the country and yet you're running for president. And so I want to ask you about that and what you're doing with the campaign donations then that are that you're collecting on this campaign that you I mean, ultimately, if you were to win, you couldn't actually take office. That is a very good question by Kim. Get that question right out of the gate because that was the very first question that I had. Elvin Brown says the 15th Amendment changes the natural born citizens rule. He's going to get into the amendment issue. I still don't know about this, you guys. Like, I don't know if this can happen. I'm just being honest with you. So you guys know how I am. I'm not here to tell you to donate to people, to donate to politicians, but... Let me let him explain. Maybe this is something that I just was not aware of. But from what I understood, if you weren't born here, you cannot run for president or you cannot be president. Yeah, let's talk about that, Kim. So first of all, that's false. Um, so let's go through that. First of all, um, it's a very important discussion that needs to be had. You know, most of everything I've done, uh, it's always been to educate people. And we'll talk more about that. But Article 2, Section 1, Clause 5 of the Articles, right, which was done in 17... 87. Um, there's a couple of things people need to understand in history class. First of all, the Constitution is a living document. Amendments change previous things. So if you follow Article 2, Section 1, Clause 5, which is the qualifications of president, by the way, it refers to he, okay, according to if you followed that by the letter of the law, a woman cannot be president, but we know the 19th Amendment was passed. But Article 2, Section 1, um, Clause 5 talks about the qualifications of president. You have to be 35 years old, right? You have to be natural born, which the founders, interestingly enough, never defined. And then the next thing it talks about is you have to be a resident in the United States at a certain time. Interesting right. enough, the Maryland legislature um, made Marquis de Lafayette, who was never born in the United States, and all of his heirs, a natural born citizen. And you can go do your research on that. Now, you go to the fact that the Bill of Rights came. So the First Amendment, you know, all those important rights came. And then we had the 14th Amendment, which was probably one of the most fundamental amendments that was passed, as important, you could argue, as the Bill of Rights, which is the Equal Protection Clause. So when you go to the Equal Protection Clause, um, it clearly says a naturalized citizen cannot be distinguished from a natural born citizen. You cannot have two levels of citizenry. So since that passing over 100 years ago, uh, there have been many, many court rulings where people brought up the fact how a naturalized citizen was being discriminated as a natural born. And the coach, courts have overwhelmingly consistently said that you cannot do this. It's a violation of the 14th Amendment. Now, what's occurred is that if you look at the history of this law, um, the FEC in 2011, a guy called Hassan, uh, wanted to get on the ballot in New Hampshire. Now, this looks like he was trying to do a money-making venture uh, when you actually look at it, not about really running for office. 
So he wanted to get presidential matching funds. The New Hampshire Secretary of State said, I, I can't put you on the ballot because you're not natural born. And again, the secretaries of state need to be educated. Um, but he, but the FEC, which is the governing body, really the agency on this, interesting enough, ruled after that that a you can a naturalized citizens can run for president. In fact, can collect donations. Okay, but they left out the uh, presidential matching funds. So in 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 court rulings, there's a very very important principle called agency deference huge body of law that have been done on that. An agency deference says that a court, even a Supreme Court justice, must defer to the agency to being the subject matter expertise, the SME on it. So FEC is their subject matter expertise. So by the law, A, I can run, and I, B, I can collect donations. Now, we have filed a what's called a declaratory relief with Merrick Garland. We've sued Merrick Garland and Gary Thompson on two counts. First of all, is that by the law, not only can I run, but also be president. And this is an educational process that needs to be taking place. And so the declaratory relief, which we filed in DC about, uh, about a month ago, it tells the courts to order, no different than Brown versus Board of Education, that we want Merrick Garland to order, or the courts to order Merrick Garland to inform all the states, right? Because we live in a, a republic, each state can decide ultimately the requirements for ballot access. In Massachusetts, for example, you have to collect 10,000 signatures. In Vermont, right. you have to collect 1,000 signatures. And when you collect those signatures, and they may have other requirements, right? You may have to have electors and you may have to have X number of meetings. So we want Merrick Garland or the, the, this, uh, the courts to uh, order Merrick Garland to tell all the Secretary of States when our volunteers, and we have about couple hundred thousand already all over the, uh, the United States, when they collect signatures and they submit preemptively, if they do that, that's a violation of the constitution. So that's what we've done. So let me just pause there, there for just a second. Uh, I think that he made some really interesting points there. This is my first time, uh, here, my second time watching this, this interview, but this is my first time actually hearing someone make that point that technically, if you look at the actual language uh, that's in the Constitution and the different articles, technically it doesn't say, uh, according to him in, in legal terms, it doesn't say that someone like him can't run uh, for president. So this is really interesting. Uh, we're going to go on to like Kim's, Kim has like a, a point to make here that I think is important, but this is really interesting. And I, I like to look into this a little bit further. But I also try to see if I can interview him to see, you know, how many people are aware of this. So let's let uh, Kim continue here. So this would, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to push back on this idea. If, if, if it is the case that a naturalized citizen and not natural born could actually hold office. Now, I agree you could run for office, you could collect donations, but that's different than actually then being allowed to take office once you win, if you were to win. Right. Um, and there would be a lot of pushback on this because we all live through the birther gate, you know, the Obama birth certificate saga, where it was, where was he really born? Yeah. Oh, he was born in Kenya. Yeah. And so he could not be president. I mean, there was millions upon millions of people who believed that Barack Obama was not born in the United States and therefore could not actually be eligible to hold office. So what would you say to all of the people who fought that, well, even Donald think, Trump himself, for all those years. Yeah, look, first of all, um, a lot of these people probably are smoking weed and weren't, didn't really study the Constitution. Um, just because someone on the right or the left says that the sun rises on the east doesn't mean they're wrong, okay? So let's take the sort of general philosophical perspective. First of all, I, don't, I haven't investigated, I haven't looked at Obama's birth certificate or not, so I haven't had the chance to do that investigation, but I can tell you that Obama, if he was indeed born somewhere else, uh, he should have taken this head on because the 14th Amendment makes it absolutely unconstitutional to deny me the right to be president. Now, Paul Clark is one of the leading legal scholars in the country on this, and Paul has written one of, a wonderful legal review on this. And the three points that we've argued in our court suit is, first of all, the First Amendment says any Political speech is the most protected form of speech. So my running for office, I should be able to run. Number two, the 14th Amendment um, 
you know, was really established for the states. But Bowling versus Green extended that back at the federal level to the Fifth Amendment, which is due process. So the law is there. And then another very important principle is called let the political process decide. Let me pause here for just a second because someone just made an excellent point. Uh, Der Quantin Alchemist. So yes, technically, even a foreigner can become U.S. president provided he lived at least 12 years in the U.S. and of course is loyal to the U.S. So yes, technically, even a naturalized citizen can become U.S. president provided he lived at least 12 years in the U.S. and of course is loyal to... Okay, so... Well, I'll have to look into this. Like, I'll, I'll have to, you know, you guys know how I am. I can't just take someone's word. Like, I'll have to look into this um, a little bit more. Because, again, I, I've, I've never heard this, and it could just be that I never heard it. But uh, I'll definitely have to to look into it. Uh, Mad Crab Sabs, I have his contact. I'll DM you, Mad Crab. Thank you. Shout out to Mad Crab in the house. I'll let him continue a little bit more on here, and then we're going to go to the next the next clip. Um, and this is something even the legal scholars who thought that this was wrong and said, yeah, let the political process decide. But fundamentally, relative to Obama, I, I think he claimed he was a constitutional lawyer. Um, so if he was, in fact, born somewhere else, he should have argued it. So yes, I will be doing some innovation here, breaking ground, as I've always had to do throughout my entire life on everything I've had to do to struggle to get what I've gotten. But this is in 10, 15 years from now, um, when, you know, look, if uh, Merrick Garland doesn't do it, um, it'll go to the appeals court and we'll win in the Supreme Court. It's black and white on this issue. The, the preponderance of case law clearly saying that a naturalized citizen and a natural born citizen cannot be discriminated has been over and over and over and adjudic adjudicated in the courts. Yeah. Okay. Let's go ahead to the next clip. I'll have to look into that, you guys. Like I said, I don't, I don't know, man. I have to do my own research with that. I want to go into this part of the interview here where they start to discuss the controversy surrounding him inventing email. When I told you guys we were going to dive into this as well, because there have been other people. Uh, if you look up who invented email, you'll see uh, a gentleman by the name of Ray Tomlinson credited for inventing email. He brings up Thomas Hayes. Uh, and then there's also that Times uh, article that came out that credited uh, Dr. Shiva for inventing email. So here we go. Let's get into the email issue here. And it is to say, like, I can confirm, obviously, I mean, I live here locally. I worked at MIT years ago. I can confirm, like, Dr. Shiver is very intelligent. Yes, he did teach at MIT. Yes, he did attend MIT. I can confirm all those things. I know those, you know, from my own experience. Uh, but I want to get into the email issue because this is the one where there seems to be pushback from people saying that it wasn't him. So I want you to hear his side of the story here. Because my programming skills were so good, Dr. Michelson was still there. He gave me another opportunity. If you go back to that period, women could only do three or four jobs. Or not could, but that's what they were restricted to. Teacher, nurse, secretary, or housewife. So if you went into any institution like this medical college, women were typically sitting at something called a desktop. They had something called a typewriter. You may have used this. I used it to write my papers growing up. And on their desktop, uh, they had something called an inbox, an outbox, big file folders. They would write a thing called a memo with a uh, to, from, subject. Very, very structured with a carbon paper. You'd have to put a paper and you have to put a CC, et cetera. You had these pneumatic tubes in these uh, rooms where you would write a memo. The doctor would come typically dictate to the secretary. She'd write a memo, a draft would occur. The reason I'm sharing with you all, this was a very complex system. It was the inter-office paper-based mail system. Now, on those old computers, you could do simple text messaging. That's not what I'm talking about. I was asked to convert this entire system, inbox, outbox, folders, 100 different features. You even go to inventorofemail.com and they can see that. As a 14-year-old, um, and I took on this challenge. I wrote 50,000 lines of code with eight kilobytes of memory. No one had ever done this before, translating every feature. Now you have to understand, the doctors in that hospital would come to me and say, why are you inventing this system? No one's gonna use it. I really just love going to my secretary and using this inbox, outbox folders. 
The secretaries were fascinated. They became my customers. I had great respect for them. And we made up a list of every feature and they said, Shiva, we're not gonna move from this paper-based system to this until all of those features exist. Every single thing you see in every email system today. And that's what I did, Kim, and I named that system email. Okay, let me just pause there. He he goes on. <laughs> I can already see some of the responses in the chat. You guys are hilarious. But uh, he does go on. But I wanted to just pause there and say, for people who may be skeptical in reference to a 14-year-old being able to write code, I will let you know, having worked at MIT, yes, there are, it has not been uncommon for people who are 16, 15 to come to MIT because they're just freaking geniuses. Right. So that that's not uncommon. It's not uncommon to run across those types of people there at MIT that can just they just invent shit like MIT has a lot of money because they have so many patents because so many things have been invented by not just professors and scientists and researchers there, but also students. So that's not uncommon in this neck of the woods. So let me let him continue. I don't know if you guys are fully believe this story still yet or not, but let me let him continue because there's more about this. I came up with that term a system never used before in the English language. Won one of the Westinghouse Science Awards, which was considered the baby nobles. It was written up in the local newspapers. When I came to MIT, the president of MIT, who was then the science advisor to Ronald Reagan, Paul Gray, I, I was elected student body president. He had a big event at his home. This is December of 1981. And by the way, when I came to MIT, they'd said, here's a guy who invented the first email system on the front page. So Dr. Gray said, you know, it's truly unfortunate that the Supreme Court is not recognizing software patents. It was a problem, again, legislators not understanding innovation. But in 1980, what had occurred was that the um, Copyright Office had said you could use copyright law to protect software inventions. And that was called the 1980 Computers Software Act. So Dr. Gray said, you know, Shiva, you should protect your invention. Now, I, ha I had no lawyers. My parents weren't PR people. I wrote away, there was no PDFs. You had to write for these forms. And it was not just simply putting a C with a circle around it, which, with, which a lot of people have denigrated that to. You had to submit all your code. It went back and forth. And on August 30th, 1980, a 17-year-old kid gets the first United States copyright, recognizing me as the inventor of email. I wrote the code, named it email, and have all of it right now the problem so that was the documentation there uh eric if you have time if you can try to find that online and that way i can get people close up that would help if you can find it if not don't worry about it problem is i didn't do any pr 40 33 years later my dear mom is dying of pulmonary fibrosis and a beautiful suitcase kim she has all of this organized the code the computer code doug amet the only journalist the only honest journalist who a friend of mine at Emerson, a professor there said, Shiva, you invented email. How come you haven't spoken about this? Well, Doug Amit, the senior editor, came by, went through all of it, and he wrote a very important article, front page on Time's online website called Dr. Shiva Idre, the man who invented email. Smithsonian contacted me, and they said, oh my God, you have this treasure trove of materials. We would like it. The Computer History Museum contacted me. And it was only on November, uh, so it was on February 16th, 2012, a beautiful ceremony is held in Washington. The Smithsonian received all, all these. And a young Washington Post reporter writes an article called Shiva Ayadre honored as the inventor of email. And that's when the proverbial shit hits the fan. And the proverbial shit hits the fan. And you have to remember, this is, I'm now 40 years old. I've been at MIT, taught at MIT, won every major award at MIT, Fulbright scholarship, right? on the front page of MIT, inventing e -Echo Mail, another company I did for automatically analyzing email, which we built into a quarter of a billion dollar company, which started from me getting the White House as my first customer, my second life with email. I was called Dr. Email. No one else has a problem with this, but the day it went into the Smithsonian, a racist scumbag historian by the name of uh, uh, Thomas Haig, who thinks he is the one who's gonna own the history of email, calls me a fraud, a liar, Gizmodo, you may remember them from Gawker Media, uh, writes an article saying this asshole, this dick, this cur and another blog says this curry stained Indian should be beaten and hanged. Unbelievable. This is not in 1952, Jack, Jackie Robinson. This is in 2012. And I never wanted any of this fame. Now I'm teaching a class at MIT for free, not like Elizabeth Warren for $400,000 while I'm running Cytosolve, another one of my inventions. 
Let me just pause here for just a second because there's something else I want to add um, as well. Uh, in science, uh, people can get pretty cocky sometimes in reference to inventions. I've, I've worked with, when I worked at MIT, I worked in obviously the science departments, right? So, and I worked in science departments at BU as well. But um, people can get really cocky, especially over like who invented what and, uh, you know, is that person more intelligent? And like, some people don't want to hear this when I say it, but I said it at BU and I'll say it again. Science is actually can be very conservative in a sense that there is like this expected expectation from a certain group of people that oftentimes is not expected from another group of people. Meaning that some people, you know, in science, and I saw this at MIT, although MIT has gotten better over the years where it used to be just heavily male and they didn't even want to admit women. There's a lot of things, <laughs> I can tell you, a lot of things that changed. But I like noticed some things. Some of the things I noticed was just like, it seemed like if something was invented by a white male, it was just automatically just like, oh, okay, yeah, of course. But there te tends to be, and not just like an MIT thing, but a science in general, there tends to be more hesitancy when it is someone who is a woman or someone who is a man of color, or and particularly a woman of color. There seems to be more pushback. And this is a problem in science. We've talked about it oftentimes when I worked at those institutions that they have to change their way of thinking. They have to decolonize their mind. So we've talked about this before. So some of the racist attacks that he's referring to, that is actually not surprising to me. Thousands of calls come into MIT saying, how dare this guy say he invented email? The ARPANET guys did it. Well, the military, of course. <laughs> yeah, it's the always military the military, right? Yeah. Exactly. And you yeah. nailed it. And this is the issue. You got to understand, I was a model minority, which MIT loves. The liberal elites love to promote the model minority when you are, when they think you are part of their establishment. And we're going to pause that part there and we're going to go into the next clip. Uh, that's actually a really good point that he makes there, how the liberal elite love you, the model minority, when you are a part of their establishment. The moment that you try to go against them, that's when they have issues with you. So I said this, the same thing about uh, Keith Olbermann's attack on Cornell West. People loved Cornell West when he's a part of the Democratic Party. The moment he does what they consider to be stepping out of line, they have issues. We're now going to go to another part of that interview where he brings up the Postal Service and free speech. And I thought this part was uh, very important, where he brings up the Postal Service and free speech. And that part he made there about, he said about Elizabeth Warren, it's true, like, Elizabeth Warren, like, these people make a lot of money. Some people make a lot of money teaching these classes, you know? Um, okay, yeah, go ahead and do that, Eric. I want to show people that image. I'll come out of the, the Zoom part. So Eric did find that document. So I do want to go ahead and show that up here. And here it is. Boom, bam, boom. So here's that document, guys. So it says Certificate of Copyright Registration. I'll make it bigger for you guys, as big as I can. Certificate of Copyright Registration. It says August 30th, 1982. Hope you guys can see this well. Title of this work, email, previous or alternative titles, computer program for electronic mail system. Name of author, Mr. Shiva Iandure. So that's his name. Created and write entire text of the in computer program. So this is the document I did want to show you. And it says copyright claimants, Mr. Shiva and it gave his address uh, in New Jersey at that point in time. Then it said here, mail certificate to Shiva at 97 Bay State Road, Boston. So that's important too. So that shows you that was during the time when he was at MIT. So, and not everybody that goes to MIT stays in Cambridge. Some of them stay over on the BU side of that Boston Bridge, just FYI. So this is really, this is it. Just wanted to show this to you guys.
So certificate of registration, of copyright registration. Okay. You got mail, Elvin. Yes. Okay. Let's go into this, this conversation here about the post office and its connection to free speech. I thought this was pretty interesting. I didn't know about this. Look, you guys are not in the business of just letters. You guys are in the communications business. Right. And when, when the founders created the First Amendment, they also created concomitantly the Postal Service, which was to give teeth to the First Amendment. And they created a police force that I could send you a letter and you could send me a letter. No one could interfere. That's how they made free speech equal free reach, which Musk is completely destroying. The founders had this concept. Everyone should be able to equally send a letter at a very simple price. Postal Service is quite an extraordinary organization. It is so interlinked with the First Amendment. A lot of people have forgotten this. So when I saw email, I said, this is really dangerous. Private companies where everyone was getting free email accounts. No one was reading the terms of service, which said they own your emails. So I told the Postal Service, you should create a public email service. And this would be quite extraordinary because people could choose, you know, like you choose FedEx or DHL, or you could choose Postal Service. So what he's saying is that the post office actually has a connection to free speech in the sense that no one is supposed to intercept that mail between it going from the post office to your house or to your apartment or wherever it's supposed to go to that no one is supposed to intercept that communication and take it away. And what he started to notice, I guess, over the years with email is that like, whoa, anybody can see this. You know, there were so many different ones, you know, Yahoo and Gmail and all that kind of stuff that came about where other people could have access to that information. You sending someone an email that you thought was private and just between you and that other person actually has other eyes on it as well. Not like the post, the postal service. So he made the connection between those two. And that was something I never really thought about before. They said, ah, get out of here. You're a 29 year old kid. What do you know about our business? We're bigger than Walmart. Don't you understand that? We're never going to move to that. That makes no sense to us. Mm -hmm. 1997, 2011, the postal service is going out of business. Yeah. And I do a scathing article in time with fast company. I see these guys are a bunch of morons. They don't have the same level of innovativeness as Franklin did. And they should really have absorbed my understanding. And that goes viral. The head of the, the inspector general, Dave Williams, calls me, he goes, Shiva, why are you attacking the postal service? You know, he hires me. And I don't know if it was trying to quiet me down. They give me $100,000 to do two analytical commission me. To, and I show them how the postal service can make two to $3 billion annually by offering a service like this. They do nothing. When I met with Trump, he did nothing with it. But the bottom line is. So I wanted you guys to hear that part. So apparently he did bring this, according to him, he brought this idea uh, to other people. And one of the people that he brought it to was to Donald Trump. And he said there was nothing done with it. Dr. Shiva in the past, it seems like he's kind of changed his opinion about Trump. Uh, but Dr. Shiva in the past uh, supported or vocally at least supported Donald Trump. Uh, but he doesn't seem to be in <laughs> in favor of Trump anymore. <laughs> I, I don't know what made him uh, change his tune, but uh, I do know he's running as an independent. And I think that's really interesting, but uh, he seems to be more critical of, of Trump now. That the private companies now own our physical email infrastructure. The founders never wanted this. And my right. thesis is like the postal service could become the bulwark infrastructure for mesh networks, which would support an equivalent of not only email, but also social media. Now, why is this important? Because encryption can be broken, but the simple law is that if anyone intercepts a communication in the postal service platform, it's a 22 year sentence in prison. That's far more important than any encryption that one person can break. And I still believe that is the ultimate solution. No one individual should own something like this, yeah. be it Elon Musk, be I, it, 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 and so this so this is a good point, you know, and I, I think I think he has like interesting ideas. Um, I think that uh, he's going to get into the criticism about Elon Musk and Twitter for in just a second. But I, I do think that it might be a little bit easier if he were to explain these ideas to people like 
like when you're running for president and we we've said this in reference to Cornell West too, like for people who are academics, sometimes when they're outside of that, their that environment, that academic space, sometimes I feel like they they don't know how to tailor their conversation and their language to just everyday peeps that are not a part of that environment. And I feel like if you're running for political office, particularly if you're running for president, I think he's going to have to find a way to get straight to the point. <laughs> I don't know. What I'm, saying. I'm sorry. I think it's just something that like people who are academics that are running for office, they have to work on that. You have to be able to hit those points, I think, pretty quickly. Right. Um, and you have to realize who you're speaking to because you're, you're not speaking to like other academics. You're not speaking to people at MIT and you're not speaking to other inventors. You're talking to uh, you know, Joe that works at McDonald's, like you're, you're going to be talking to, I don't know, Susan who works at the car wash down the street. Like you have to find a way to tailor that message and make it short and concise and to the point. I'm going to let Kim, um, say her piece here and we'll go to the next clip. It's a really, it's a great idea. I think that the, the so I I'm with you on that. I think that that is potentially a really good solution because, you know, if the government, so this is where it gets tricky, right? So it seems like the solution would be that the government, the postal service, would run this this uh, email service. That they would give us email addresses, or we would, you know, get them somehow from the the post office. We would be able to exchange information with one another. P potentially, they could even create an equivalent to Twitter. It's like a town square; people can actually exactly. post their thoughts. Exactly. And but the so the problem is you're going to have people say, oh, we don't want the government to have anything to do with that because then the government's going to yeah. spy on us. The government's going to interfere. But the reality is, is that the government is bound by the First Amendment. They're really not. There you I go. Mean, they could try. They could try, but they would get in trouble. The way they've been doing it with these social media companies is through the back door. They've been saying, well, yep. we're not you doing it. it. We're not doing it. They're doing it on their own. Yep. And, but then we find out they're pressuring them. And so that's why it's potentially mm -hmm. illegal. But we still have to prove that in court with the various cases. But it's directly illegal if they do it. And it's we've got a government entity that's yep. supposed to be delivering us our communications. The government's interfering. That would be directly an infringement, exactly. a violation of that First Amendment. So a lot of me does believe, actually, that, you know, I know a lot of people don't believe the government is the solution. But in some cases, in certain scenarios, it's just like I don't want private people owning roads because then they're maybe going to tell right. me I can't drive on them. Right. I mean, there are exactly. certain services like the fire department, the police department, that I right. want the government right. to be in charge of because it needs to be a service for all without discrimination. Whoa. And then we're going to go to the next clip. And that part that Kim mentioned about private roads, something I wanted to say about that is, yeah, if you go to like some of these other towns, like there are um, private roads, like especially here in Massachusetts, if you, some of these towns here, there's like a, a private road that you, like, you, you just can't drive down that road. <laughs> Uh, because uh, someone else owns it and uh, not the state. So let's get into this piece here where he starts to talk about uh, Twitter. I go, this has nothing to do with it. I said, you guys violated federal law. Up until that point, Kim, I have about 300,000 followers on Twitter. And I'm a bona fide federal candidate because we moved our candidacy to a write-in campaign. You have to understand, we raised $2 million off Twitter. Twitter is the most important platform for politics. Instagram may be for celebrities, Facebook is for right. friends and families, but Twitter is the default facto platform. So I take my four emails, which are public property, and I say Massachusetts destroyed 1 million ballot images. Didn't say ballots. And it starts going viral and I share the four emails with the Secretary of State's General Counsel, Michelle Tassinari, who's in that diagram, so he's referring to when he ran, he's referring to when he ran against Elizabeth Warren, when Elizabeth Warren was running for a re-election. That's what he's referring to. Says, you know, we don't have to say ballot images. That starts going viral. Suddenly I get taken down, never been taken down since 2007. I'm running for federal office, right? So I still have 60 days. And Reuters, another <laughs> ridiculous organization, puts out a press release saying, Shivaya Duray taken off Twitter because he was saying ballots were destroyed. You see, they left out the word images. 
And then a fact checking organization does a blessing in disguise for me. They said, yeah, he's lying, but they say, we contacted the Secretary of State and they told us the government of Massachusetts contacted Twitter. And I go, whoa, 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 government, like you said, the reason sometimes it's good to have government own these things is government, the highest form of speech is political speech. So the government, according to that report, had contacted Twitter. So immediately I look for lawyers to file a First Amendment lawsuit. I'm still running for office in a federal U.S. Senate campaign. Yeah, so this would have been even different if he were not running for office at that time. I know several people that have had their accounts suspended or removed uh, on Twitter, and that shouldn't happen. None of those people, in my opinion, did anything wrong. Uh, but he was a political candidate, and they removed him. And obviously, it is true that Twitter is like the vehicle in reference to uh, politics when you look at the social media platforms. Twitter is that platform for the most part. And so they removed his account, which in a sense hurts him promoting his campaign. Uh, imagine if that happened to anyone else. Imagine if Twitter removed Joe Biden's account tomorrow. Think about that for a second. So he had an issue with it. But the point that I'm trying to highlight here, this is going back to that particular election, because what this shows you is that even back then, Dr. Shiva had already called out the fact that they were removing people. The government was telling Twitter to remove people from Twitter before Elon Musk even started the Twitter files. He had already brought this to the attention of people, and you'll hear later on, of some people like Elon Musk and Tucker Carlson. He had already brought this up because it happened to him. Let's continue. No lawyer wanted to take this, Kim. Why? Because the Secretary of State is a guy called Bill Galvin. He's known as the Prince of Darkness. He owns every freaking politician in Massachusetts, every judge. So I had to do this myself. I don't know law. I've never represented myself in federal court. I had to go study state action. I filed not only the lawsuit against the government. Remember, I filed against the government, not against Twitter. And in that lawsuit, I filed a PI, a preliminary injunction. Judges do not like to give PIs unless it's an emergency and you're likely going to win the overall lawsuit. So anyway, I go, I think October 15th, some, somewhere around there, into federal court. I was given the PI hearing, which itself is a big victory. I wrote to Tucker Carlson, who I call another name, starting with an F. Okay, you can add it, okay? Because the reason I called him that is he claims to be a fighter for free speech, you know, a patriot. This guy got everything I gave him. He got, I said, Tucker, I have the most important lawsuit violating free speech. Then on October 15th, me and the judge cross-examine the social media director of the Secretary of State, the government of Massachusetts. The judge says, how did you decide to throw Dr. Shiva off? Why? He goes, oh, he was spreading misinformation. What was the misinformation? He was saying ballots were destroyed, which I didn't say, I said ballot images. Nonetheless, the judge says, well, what did you do? She goes, well, we, we, we wanted this down. He goes, what did you do? Well, we contacted Twitter. He goes, how did you do that? He goes, we have a portal, the partner support portal. He goes, what's that? He goes, we get VIP treatment. And he goes, really? And he goes, what did you do? He goes, we informed that he needed to, you know, this needed to come down. And he goes, what happened? This is all in transcript, Kim. And we put, so we had is, it up on winbackfreedom.com. So this is the same information that was revealed during the Twitter files, that they did have that portal and that government agencies were able to contact Twitter and ask for certain executives to remove certain people. So it's just, it, to me, and what's interesting to me, and he goes on to talk about this more, if you can imagine, uh, that he brought this up apparently to Tucker Carlson and Tucker Carlson apparently didn't really care to hear about it then. This is Dr. Shiva's words, you know, not, not my own, but let's go on. Now, here's where he gets more into what happened with uh, other people that he reached out to in reference to what Twitter was doing at that point in time. I brought you guys, here's one word, freedom. And that's what I remembered. I wasn't willing to sell out. Now, all of that stuff was out there and we're screaming to all these people who claim to be conservatives to help us. They did shit. Fast forward to October 28, 2022. Musk is saying, let this sink in bullshitter Maximus. And I put out a post on Facebook. I said, Elon, 
if you want to if you want to talk about free speech call me the backdoor portal exists are you going to take it down go look, review our lawsuit the next day came like timing the intercept which is a government front end okay <laughs> puts out a news story. Oh my God, DHS leaks. We found this backdoor portal. They literally plagiarized one piece of my law piece of the lawsuit, which is called a limited hangout, which I've came to find as a CIA technique, where you take a little piece to quiet the masses down. Then fucker Carlson puts Lee Fang on his TV sh show. And we have all the transcripts. He goes, oh my God, Lee, how come everyone ignored this? You fucking ignored it. <laughs> I don't know what to say, you guys, except for yikes. Fucker Carlson ignored it. He's an ah. actor. So what happens? So I get put back on Twitter. They thought I would be a good house slave, bow down to Musk. So the first tweet I do gets around 20 to 30 million views. I go, Elon, why don't I become your Twitter CEO since you're looking for one? I invented email. I got all the credentials. And I stand for free speech. That goes viral. The next day, I said, Elon, are you going to take down the backdoor portal? I do. So if you look at my tweets in December, four tweets on that. Clayton Morris from Redacted in a big Twitter spaces, he said, Elon, Dr. Shiva's lawsuit discovered this backdoor infrastructure. Are you going to remove it? And how do you reconcile that with your position as a free speech absolutist? He goes, oh, that sounds like big brother. I'll get back to you. Complete acting. Nothing happens. And then I start escalating my tweets, Kim. The next January, 15 tweets. Elon, are you going to take down this fucking portal? Here's all the data. And my tweet, my impressions go from 500,000 views per day down to 300,000, now down to 10,000 views. You guys know I'm going to look this up on Twitter, right? You guys know I'm going to search Twitter to see if these tweets went out. <laughs> because I was attacking this fool. And you have to understand, if you're really going to be sincere about it, where Elon Musk begins and where government ends, nobody knows. The guy's invented nothing. He was He's a creation of Silicon Valley because Vijay Agade and Jack Dorsey were open fascists. They would say, oh, you're talking about vaccines, you're gone. But Silicon Valley and Congress are like this. Why? Because a social media platform gets a 10x on valuation of revenue. A publishing company like the New York Times gets a 2x. So if the New York Times makes a billion, they're only worth 2 billion. But if Twitter makes a billion, they're worth 10 billion. Who came up with these valuations? Well, Twitter was given this valuation on a social media platform for the simple reason they got Section 230 indemnity. You can't sue a social media company. You can sue the New York Times. So because they're preventable from lawsuits, they get a higher valuation. And I'm going to go ahead and stop it there. Uh, very interesting things there. These are definitely some things that I think we need to think about. Um, there are some things that I, I have questions. I, ha I got questions. <laughs> I got 21 questions from that song. By yeah. Anywho. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it, it just. Uh, 50 Cent said 21 questions. Jay-Z said 99 questions. I have some questions. I just, I really do. It's a lot to take in. But I will also say that I'm, I'm curious in reference to if these things happen prior to the Twitter files and all of this was ignored, then that really makes me just kind of sit back and think, do they did they really care about free speech or just only when it suited their pockets or did they actually want the credit for it like did elon musk really care about free speech or did he just want the credit for it i don't know i don't know man but how did you guys feel in reference to him being a candidate one thing i will say i think he should have talked about his platform more i heard a lot about like what he accomplished, but he's running for president. I think he should have talked more about policy, what he plans to do and what he intentions to his intentions are in reference to uh, his political campaign. But you guys voted. How do you feel? Eric, I'll go ahead and put the poll up here if you're ready. All right. So we have 608 votes. How do you feel about Dr. Shiva's campaign as an independent candidate? 18% said hopeful, 
12% said somewhat hopeful, 26% said not hopeful, and 44% of you said haven't decided yet. Yeah, and I think the reason why I think the majority say haven't decided yet is because he didn't talk enough about his presidential campaign and he is running for office. So I think the next interview that he does, I think he needs to focus more so on his campaign. Thank you, uh, Kiss a City. Kiss a City. Bring Shiva on for an interview. I can try to do that. Thank you for the super chat, Fen Tomas. Shiva is a lackey for people like Giuliani and Bannon, known as a bomb thrower who supports insincere people, satellites around right-wing media personalities. I would question even air he breathes. Interesting. Delthea says he has good ideas, but his personality needs work, a lot of work. Bryce says, I like this guy. Wow, this is interesting. I don't think I've ever seen the chat so uh, divided. <laughs> you guys, there's mixed views in the chat about Dr. Shiva. I'll take the comments on Rockfin. And then we will bounce. Thank you for the tip on Rockfin, Roger. Did this guy say that he was not born in America and he wants to run for president? Did I hear that right? Because if so, he can't be president. Look, I've had to look into all of this, right? And thank you for the tip, Snork. Two Secretary of States had, ha excuse me, two Secretary of States had to have hearings to be eligible, but had to be stripped of ability to become president. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I don't know, guys. I don't know. But I'll try to see if I can get Dr. Shiva on and uh, focus. I, I want to focus on, like, his campaign, like, where he wants to go with that. I think the, uh, the campaign ad, I think he did a good job with the ad. Um, but what was funny to me is when he said the establishment... And you notice it had Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton as the establishment and people who are also establishment but pretend not to be. And it showed TYT and Vouch and all of those people. I think that's very, very, uh, very important to highlight. <laughs> I'm just keeping it real. Anywho, <laughs> Bryce says I'm going to have to clarify. <laughs> oh, man.